like we talked about last time, I mean, literally, besides me and you, I don't see anybody putting out content about prolonged fasting. I would say, guys, start at the maximum one gram per pound of body weight. But if they lighten the weight too much, right, and they get really comfortable with benching, you know, you know, 40 pounds, at, you know, as a 200 pound male, like it's a problem. They, they, they literally weaken and then no one's talking about this. No one's mentioning this. And I tell them, guys, it's a training stimulus. It's first and foremost. A lot of people want to overlook that. And I'm like, it's, it's hard to train to put on muscle. So if you don't get that right, it doesn't really matter what you're eating. You're not going to change much. Welcome, welcome back, everybody, to the Lasting Weight Loss Podcast with Dr. Jones. And I am so stoked to have a, uh, Kyle, a.k.a. Panda Man. We got to talk about where that name came from. That's one of the questions I have for you. How are you doing today, my man? I'm doing great, bro. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, we. Uh, I was on your show, what, it was like two months ago? Yeah, it was actually December. December. So yeah. several, man, time flies by fast. No, I know, man. But it's cool, man. I, I, I love watching your content because uh, like we talked about last time, I mean, literally, besides me and you, I don't see anybody putting out uh, content about prolonged fasting. So you'll see, you know, Dr. Berg, Thomas DeLauer, um, Jason Fung and Mindy Pels. Those are the big four and them. And they put out a lot of great content, but none of them embrace prolonged fasting the way me and you do. Yeah, uh, it's more of like this is powerful. It could be very helpful. They're still, I think, they're a little bit more cautious and reserved about it, which I totally respect and appreciate. I think we're both pioneering something that, um, in my opinion, is probably the most powerful intervention. And I sounds like you agree. <laughs> oh yeah, thousand percent, man. There's, there's nothing else like it. You know, as we as we know from last time we talked. But yeah, I think a lot of them get caught up with they don't want to recommend protocols that are can be perceived as extreme, you know, it's not really extreme for whatever reason, whether it's liability or whatever. But, um, and I think some of these people want to try to please everybody and you can't do that. No. And, and, and in my opinion, it is, it is liability for sure. I mean, we're, we're in uncharted territory and, uh, we don't have enough literature in the prolonged. I mean, we barely, uh, we technically don't even have enough uh, to to make intermittent fasting the standard, right? But it's in that early stages, the, the literature is, is growing. And so even mainstream medicine is having a hard time saying that intermittent fasting isn't on some level helpful, but it's the prolonged stuff that uh, really is, is, as you know, very, very powerful. And I hope, man, I'm hoping 10, 20 years, it can start being embraced more. I mean, look how long it took intermittent fasting to get to where it's yeah. at now. So, and that's actually one of my questions too. So why don't we just dive right in? Um, so why don't we start with just a little bit of background with you, man? Like, how did you get into what you're doing now? Is this what you've always done? Did you kind of make a lateral in your career? Let, let's start with that. Yeah, sure. So when I came out of college in 2003, I interned with Rutgers football strength and conditioning. And it was around that time as well. You know, I went to the University of Delaware for fitness management. But around that, that summer, I decided to hey, compete in bodybuilding, natural bodybuilding show, 2004. So I got really into that. I was already into it since high school. Like I was really obsessed with just learning the science. And then with my first couple of competitions, it was your standard starvation protocols, faulty advice, a lot of junk audio, really wrecked my metabolic rate for, for over a decade. Because I, I kept going into that pattern. That was all I knew. And each time I had to go back and get contest ready, I had to starve myself. And if I wasn't in contest prep mode, I could be even still in a deficit if you're just going based off calories. And I wouldn't look the way I should. Like I wasn't lean. I wasn't. It was very frustrating. Now, at the same time, as I was doing that, I went back to school for teaching. So the health and fitness ed teacher started started in uh, 2006 was my first year. The contest that year, I decided while I was getting ready that I was going to start my own business. Because Jim, everybody would come up and ask me advice on nutrition, training, because I was doing some unusual training at the time, kind of ahead of the curve. So I started Strength, which is my gyms. I have two gyms here in New Jersey. And then in 2012, I resigned 
from teaching uh, to do that full time. Fast forward to 2019, five years, almost exactly five years ago, we were running this back better contest we run annually at the end, which actually just started yesterday for this year. And I was taking in that with the staff. And at that point, I had been fasting, like when you're intermittent fasting for about five years, 16, 18. Once in a blue moon, I would do one blue day, and I thought that was really pushing the envelope. But that year, I said, you know, let me dive back into research, just study as much as I can, and start trying to do longer fasts. So I started with 48. And the rest of that summer, I pretty much did a second, two hour fast every week. And I'm like, man, this is freaking amazing. This is powerful. So what, what, what year was that when you did your first prolonged fast? 2009. 2009. Wow. We have a very similar timeline. That's hilarious. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. So since that time, I kind of documented everything. And I realized, hey, this is something that could benefit a lot of other people. And instead of like at the gyms, we would give them, you know, your typical nutrition advice, you know, looking at macros, calories, all this. And very rarely did it actually work. You know, it was like, so documented all this, wrote a book on it during the COVID uh, period of time. So about four years ago, I wrote a book on it um, for my method. And I started coaching people on it. You know, I started taking people through like a five or six week challenge, really teaching them what, what I did. And the results have been fantastic. So based off of that, I came to Panda Man. You know, that that's kind of a uh, where that originated from as far as, you know, doing the online stuff. So the Panda Man, tell me a little bit about kind of the development of, of that name and, yeah, and, yeah. and, and, and that, that whole thing. Cause, cause I was just thinking about like, I don't even know how, how you came up with that. Yes. Yeah, so I'd love to, I'd love to know that. Yeah. So there was this basketball player, Ron Artest. He's about my age, maybe a year or two older. He was the one that was involved in, it, in what's called the malice and the balance when they were, you know, the Indiana you know, Pacers, the Detroit Pacers, he went up into the crowd, got in a fight with some like So he was kind of infamous. He was always getting in trouble. But I loved the way he played, kind of more like the old school. He wound up winning a title with Kobe. Anyhow, he changed his name to like the Panda's friend or friendly panda. He had multiple name changes, but I was on his email. Saw the email, I said, oh, I'll get some of this gear. You know, this seems pretty cool. And then I started researching the actual panda animal. I'm like, well, you know, I didn't know too much about it. And I just started kind of connecting with that. Like, they say you have like a spirit animal. I'm like, okay, panda's cool, man. It's got a duality. Why people think it's this cuddly creature, but it's also very fierce. So I connected with it. And then when it came time, when I was writing my book, I was like, what am I going to call this? And I called it, you know, I have the panda tattoo. I said, let me call it the panda die. Just more for the mindset piece as far as the black and white and the, you know, the mindfulness of eating. And then about a year, two years ago, my regular Instagram account, I got kicked off, you know, under my regular name. So then I was kind of brainstorm, what, am, what should I make the new channel? So it started out as Panda Man KN, my rituals, and then we we're playing around with it, and we developed the Panda Man official. So that's really where it came from. Was the basketball player was the inspiration to take it and run with it. That's awesome. That's awesome. No, and I think it's really cool. Yeah, no, the logo, the, the branding that you're developing is is, is awesome. Thank you. Um, the color scheme too, I like the purple. Um, yeah, yeah. I've done a lot of purple too, as I've been trying to figure out my branding and logoing. So, <laughs> no, I, I love that. No, that's great. Um, okay. So let's dive into some of the nuance here. So what would you say for somebody who's completely never seen any of your stuff? What is sort of the general approach that you're taking? Um, and I guess we can even backtrack. Is it just fat loss or is it a little bit more um, and weight loss? Or is, is it even broader than that that you do? It's broader than that. Now, most 90% of people are coming to me because they want to lose weight. But you have people that want to reduce, you know, injuries or aches and pains, people that want more energy. And what I've seen through doing this five years, this long form, is that you, you can optimize the, the body to actually put on muscle and be obviously much leaner. 
sort of the approach I typically take with people is like if the, the black version, of the panda, it's a 48 hour fast, one meal a day. So typically start people with that and then we build off of it. They're going through like a five week challenge of mine. Week two might be a 72 hour fast. And hey, let's try 248s or rolling 48s. Let's see if anybody wants to do a 96. I want people to experience it and always fall back to them. Hey, what can I find my habit around? So as I said, that first summer, I was doing a 72-hour fast every week. But at the end of the summer, I realized, you know, I'm not going to do that forever. I said, so what can I continue doing? Well, 48 was simple to me. So <clears throat> for the past uh, five years, I've been eating on slightly less than because I'll do some longer fasting, but on six meals a week on average. And so I have a lot of, you know, personal experience and, and data with it. And the way you manipulate it. I've seen that, like I said, you could put on muscle, maintain muscle, no problem. So you're doing just as much men that want to build muscle as much as you are men trying to lean up. Yeah. And is it primarily men you're working with? Um, I'd say it's about 50-50. Okay. Okay. It's about 50-50. I do have women that will come through. And, and, and typically with the women, it's about fat loss. Like, that's why they're coming, you know, and they, they got frustrated with everything else that has not worked for them. And so they seek this out. Yeah, yeah, no, and, and, and it's, it's I, I, you know me, I can attest that, that prolonged fasting works. And um, I, I love I love what you're doing and, and that approach. So um, my audience knows very well the prolonged fasting and what it does for fat loss. So let's talk about a prolo- little bit deeper into the, into the muscle building. So if you got a man who, you know, body fat levels normal, maybe a little high, but, but really wants to bulk, how would you approach structuring, you know, everything else outside of the prolonged, w- would the prolonged fasting be as aggressive as you said, or, or a little bit less for somebody really trying to put on this? Um, I still, I still would keep it a 48 in there and a one meal a day because something I learned when I was bodybuilding before I started, you know, this type of fasting through various guys that coached me was that you want to be more insulin sensitive if you're going to try to put on muscle. So now when the nutrients come in, they're much more likely to calorie positioning to go to the muscle cell than the fat cell. So this is how we can kind of uh, almost not match, but come close to these people that seem to be ripped all the time and lean and big and no matter what they eat, doesn't seem fair. Well, they're, they're probably more insulin sensitive. So Very much so, yep. Yeah, and, and it's like that, that explains it, right? And insulin being the most anabolic hormone in the body, if we want to use that when we train and we eat to our advantage. So it's anabolic. It means growth. But not getting, let's try to manipulate it so it's shuttling the nutrients towards the muscle cells. So the underlying premise though, with the muscle building, so I get a lot of guys that say, I want to put on muscle, I want to put on muscle, what should I eat, what should I eat? And I tell them, guys, it's the training stimulus. It's first and foremost. A lot of people want to overlook that. And I'm like, it's, it's hard to train to put on muscle. So if you don't get that right, it doesn't really matter what you're eating. You're not going to change much. Okay? And I have to remind a lot of people, my clients, that the training is, is stress, right? And we have to continue to upgrade the stress we're applying to the body to put on the muscle. But when you do that, you optimize for the hormones and things like growth hormone, with fasting, and luteinizing hormone, you're creating this anabolic hormonal environment inside your body that's going to allow you to be leaner and to put on muscle. So if somebody, like in the example you gave, somebody that's Average body fat, a little bit higher than body fat. The main thing I would have them focus on at first, even if they say they want to put on some size, let's chop down the body fat. Let's right? chop down the body fat. Yeah, chop it down. Because this, this approach that I used to do with bodybuilding, a lot of guys do with a, the bulking seat, right? To try to put on, I'm like, you're just getting fatter. You got to heal the insulin resistance. Uh, how much muscle are you actually putting on in an inflamed potential body that has that, uh, insulin resistance built up? So get insulin sensitive. My one coach, John Meadows, who passed a couple of years ago, he would he would tell me he would want me to put like ten and twelve percent body fat in my bulk to put on muscle, which for a lot of people seems lean, but it, it made sense. And then as I started doing the fasting, I started connecting those dots and being like, okay, this he wasn't fasting, but this was his theory behind. Hundred percent, hundred percent. 
there's a, there's a lot, there's a lot there. So, you know, with the last piece you said, um, just maintaining a lower body fat year around is yep, something yep. that just pays dividends. I mean, from a health perspective, you know, you're, you're more like you, so we talked about, you're more insulin sensitive, you're more metabolically flexible, your inflammation levels are lower. Um, a lot of your markers are improved and then just, just psychologically, I mean, who doesn't like looking leaner and more fit and more healthy? There's, there, there's, there's a huge psychological improvement there as well that no one likes to talk about. And everybody gets so fixated on this bulk and lean, like you said, this back and forth. And truthfully, the person has never even figured out how to maintain lower. Le- That's more important. So I, yeah. I 100 percent align with that. Um, and and I'm more fascinated because I focus primary. I'm 95 percent fat loss, weight loss, obesity. I do some fitness, and and I you know I tell I tell the people that I'm working with. I use myself as an example. Just I'll just you know here's what I'm doing, but. But I'm definitely primarily in that fat loss um, arena. So this is super cool. I've always known this could work. I've always said, oh, I wonder if I, want, if I should expand to that. Um, so when I look at this, the only and this is, this is kind of leads to my next question. So the the contrary, you know, the opposing arguments would say you're not going to get it. You're not going to get enough protein in. You're not going to get enough calories to add the muscle mass. So you know, what do you, what do you do in that situation? They're there. You're improving, right? So we said phase one before we're really bulking is improving. So we're going to drop body fat. You know, you might put on some muscle mass, but at least maintain. So when you're really now, let's say that person finishes phase one, they're, they're, they're lean, they're chiseled, they're 12%. And they're like, all right, Kyle, I'm ready to go. I want to put on muscle mass. So what do you, what do you shift at that point in their program? Quick minute here. I wanted to tell you guys about my free resources to help you guys with your sustainable weight loss goals. I have a free Facebook community where I do weekly live coaching. It's all about helping you hit your goals and maintain your weight for the rest of your life. And I also have a free PDF where I break down step by step exactly what it takes for you to be successful. I'll put a link to this in the show and we'll see you guys back in the show. As far as the new, well, the training again has to be on point, right? And yep, looking, training stays the same, new, 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 uh, nutrition wise, calorie wise, protein wise. So, if we're looking at calories, even again, going back to what Mountain Dog had me doing, it wasn't this huge spike we had to do in calories. It, it, it would be, he would pay for like a 500 calorie jump, right? So, what are those nutrients doing when they're coming into the body? Now, as far as protein and whatnot, what I've found through personal experience, and then through research, like I used to eat three, four hundred grams a day when I was competing. Way, yeah, way over. I was kind of I would get two grams per pound. Of, like it was just crazy. Yep. And what I found was okay, animal protein is more anabolic. We don't need ugly, nearly as much told. And I look at myself and, and clients as, as proof of that. So in the average week, between three and four hundred grams of animal protein for the week, I'd take a high week for the whole week. And I look at the micronutrients more so. I'm really big into making sure we're getting fruit into the diet. I think that's like a superfood. And if we had to start measuring protein, I would say, guys, start at the maximum, one gram per pound of body weight. Because like you, it's not a good energy source. People shy away from carbs. I'm like, carbs are what's going to allow you to treat it hard, right? And again, that's the main stimulus. Hey, carb, good quality carbs that grew from the earth. Don't be afraid of that stuff. And if I looked at calories, just if I was going back to more of the old school and I had to set calories for somebody, something I would look at is that's aim for anywhere between 16 and 20 times your body weight. Now, that's going to be hard for most people to do within a one meal a day. One meal a day, right. But I, you know, that's what I personally I have tracked in years, but that's what I was doing this and tracking to get data what I was doing. I find I can eat a lot more this way and obviously maintain body composition, but build your appetite, right? So the appetite is something that can be built and the training is going to drive that uh, partially. So your body will get in what it needs, but it's a slow process. A lot of people had the mindset of putting on muscle that, hey, increase dramatic amounts of protein and calories. Again, I, I think in those cases, a lot of the times, they're not going to, it's not going to equate like they think it would to, to more muscle. So if somebody could put on one to five pounds, five pounds would be a lot, five pounds of muscle in a year. That's huge. Like if you're ripped, five pounds of muscle, 20 quarter pounders slapped on you, 
right? Like that's a lot of muscle tissue. People don't realize that. They, they just think they can confuse weight on the scale for putting on muscle. So that's kind of how I would approach it is monitor protein, build your appetite, and you can track if you need to at first. So you have a baseline, maybe my fitness pal or something. And then I would just adjust off of that. Do you, so for most of your patient or most of uh, the clients you're working with, it's not so much calorie tracking at all. Um, it, you kind of let them feed off of their body and their rhythms and yeah. And, and I 100%, that's what we do. I do that same thing on my patients. Yeah, um, yeah. just to be clear, I talk about calories. I actually, what I do for them now, and this is more so recent, I, I make them do what I call a calorie counting experiment for three weeks. I go, look, there's some intuition that you can develop that you can you can develop from from doing this for three weeks. So if you've never done this, right? If you've never done this, let's do this for three weeks. And that's it. I know it's annoying, but then we're done. And now you have this intuition. And then we go back to just operating off of, you know, the, the what the body's telling us, right? In response. And, and that's why I work with them and, and teach them that kind of stuff so they can learn and, and respond to their own body, right? And make it more yeah, self-reliant. Yeah. So um, no, that's super cool. That's super cool that you're doing that. I think uh, it, it's it's severely underutilized uh, prolonged fasting. So let me ask you this: for for you, are you um, yourself personally, and would you say the standard is maintaining that kind of one meal a day with with a forty eight hour fast every single week, or how, what's what's maintenance look like for you as far as prolonged fasting when optimal health is achieved, more or less? Yeah. So. That first summer when I was doing this, I was about 250 pounds, 16% body fat. Came down to about 225, 6% body fat. And I've maintained that weight ever since. And, you know, weight loss is not my goal. But that 48 and one meal a day is my home. That's where I live. You know, unless I'm on vacation or something, or there's some type of event that comes up. Like I used to make up that 48 if I missed it on, like I usually go Sunday night to Tuesday night. But now I don't really I know I'm like, you know, this is what I see myself doing for the rest of my life. I mean, I'll get people that say, well, can I do a seven day fast, ten day fast, three week fast? You could, but what is your goal? Like, are you trying to form a habit or to do this event? Hey, you, know, and have, you know, so I look at long term, like, hey, if you can accumulate these 48s, and, and I find that I miss them. Week said for whatever reason, vacation, whatever. I don't feel as good. I don't feel sharp. I don't feel as, as good physically. Uh, you could almost feel like you, you're, in my opinion, like clogging the body a little bit by not giving it the break. So now when I see people that are just eating your typical North American three, four meals a day, it's, man, it's hard to even fathom going back to it. Like no matter what, even on my cheat day, usually just one meal. Right. So feel better. Yeah, I, I go back and forth on literally I go back and forth on. So I have these pillars of, of optimal optimal health with with regard to lasting weight loss and tie, uh, resistance training and building muscle mass is, is number three. But tied between one and two is either. And I and I literally I think I think it depends on the person I'm talking to. Right. So that's why I say they're tied. But the regular long fasting and then reduction of proce- uh, consumption of processed foods, like reducing. And I do the 90-10 rule with my patients when they start because I'm very big on sustainability. So 90% yeah, yeah. keep it clean, 10%, whatever the hell you want. Like reward yourself. I don't actually want you going crazy because we, are, you know, a lot of people get really excited about their program when they're losing and like, oh, I, could, I can go 100% clean, but that's not sustainable. Like, yes. Yeah. And ketogenic diets are not sustainable. So yeah. uh, great tool can use them as a tool, but it's not sustainable. Right. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, fasting as much as people go probably to us for the first time, you guys are crazy. That's not sustainable. It's sustainable. Once you get into the rhythm, it yes. really is so much more sustainable, uh, regular rounds of prolonged fasting than a ketogenic diet. It's just so much easier. So, um, and we could probably go on and on about that, but, um, so that's, that, that's awesome. No, I, I yeah, like, yeah. I like that. That's your approach. Yeah, yeah. So to be clear, I want to make sure I understood you 48 every week is, yeah, yeah. is a maintenance for you. And that's what you preach to, to your clients. Yeah. That's what I try to get them to is that 48. And then if it's somebody that's got a ton of weight to lose then we get more aggressive, with them. I always tell them, Hey, this is your foundation. This is your own. Cause the way I look at fat too, is it's a great self-development tool. 
because you got to master that inner dialogue. You're going to have to move to oh, I don't feel like doing this or whatever it is. And what are you going to do at that point when you can't turn to food, and food is a drug, right? You, when you can't turn to that to calm yourself down or to kind of distract yourself, you've got to go inward. So I look at it, you know, those other levels, the mental, the spiritual, and I feel like it's uh, it's uncomfortable every time I do it a little bit. But again, doing it for long periods of time, it just it gets simpler. You don't you don't really dwell on and depriving yourself at all. I look at it as a gift I'm giving myself. I feel that I've gotten biologically younger. Like I feel great. So yeah, I've got. That's where I try to get people. You know, and I, and I really try to harp on the fact that this is a lifestyle. Get to where you want to go, and then you go back three, five times a day. What do you think is going to happen? All right. All right. Have you happened to have any testing specifically looking at telomere length, biological age? I haven't, have you I haven't done that. Yet? I would like to do it. The only genetic testing I really did was um, the BRCA stuff, the 10X stuff, recently, you know, last year. But I haven't done any telomere stuff. I, sh- I should do that, though. I'll send it to you. Yeah. I mean, obviously without a starter point, but I mean, it's safe to say, I'm sure yours is going to be great. Mine was pretty, pretty dang good too. I was about four years biologically younger than my chronological age. And, and I've done, uh, you know, a long like, a couple years of lots of round fasting. So, uh, long fasting and, uh, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Um, I would say, you know, the only difference I think in my approach towards yours, and it's probably more because the people that I'm dealing with, right. So I, I'm the morbidly obese, the obese, the really sick, the autoimmune, the inflammatory, all these conditions. So where I center with the flow protocol um, is, you know, 48 every week as the base during the fat loss phase, during the weight loss phase. Once I get somebody to maintenance and I live this to myself. Um, and it's interesting, though, I'm, I'm actually now now I'm, I'm wondering, like, maybe I, maybe I'll try playing with myself. Um, in the maintenance phase, 48 every week. So I've always promoted that as the way to get you to the point. And, and like you said, some patients, I have to go more. Sure. Um, I, I have this whole concept of flow fasting variability. Mm-hmm. So we switch it up. That was my next question I want to talk to you about is do you adapt to that? But, but yeah, so for me, once I get somebody to a healthy point, then we decrease the frequency, but I, but I give them a broad range. I go, look, all the other tenants, the quality, the weightlifting, the stress management, sleep management, all that supplements, that's all important. But the, 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 the thing that's going to be probably the biggest tool for you for the rest of your life is get a 48 in every two to four weeks. Yeah. And I, and they're like, that's yeah. such, that's such a big range. And I'm like, look, some of you are going to be very diligent and you're going to have phenomenal months where you're so good with everything else that you literally only need once a month to maintain a lot of you though, you're going to regress. You're going to start slipping up. You're not going to have great months. And so use that 48 as your ability to slap yourself back into it. Right. As a, as a, and so that, that's, that's the difference. And I'm just kind of thinking out loud between you, you know, that's the base for you. And I'm like, I guess I'm a little hesitant to make that the base with, with nothing other than just, cause we don't have data on this. Yeah. There's no data. Yeah. I'm not telling you there's data that says it's bad at all. Um, we don't, we're in, we're in uncharted territory. So um, but it's, it's really, it's really interesting to hear that. And, uh, it's definitely going to cause me to, to, to potentially consider, yeah. you know, situations yeah. when being more aggressive. So let me ask you this 48 per week. Do you notice some sort of adaption to that? Does it, and, and how do you navigate around that? I, I haven't noticed any adaption to it as far as body composition and whatnot. And, and I do get that question a lot. Has your body going to adapt? I feel like from all the research I've done, it's a different metabolic pathway traditional North America where calories are coming in frequently throughout the day where with the fasting I haven't seen any adaptation to it where like there's like a slowdown or anything like that. The maintenance is incredibly simple. Like okay, when I used to compete with bodybuilding, I cut calories, right? Everything would lower the match I was putting in, progress would stall, and it'd have to cut. I haven't noticed it at all. Like, in fact on this, one of the things I teach you know, my people, what I do, and again, I, I just go based on what I've done, and I, I teach it and say, hey, let's see if it works, is I try to push you. I've got a huge appetite as it is, but I try to push the envelope with how much I can eat, right? And, and I think that's an uh, underrated thing for people as far as you know, building the capacity to eat. Because metabolic rate can go up or down 
experience. Most people only experience it coming down because they've done these starvation diets. Okay, how do you get it to go up? Well, you eat more. You eat more. So you don't you don't eat the point of being sick, but let's see what your capacity is. See what your capacity is. Build that over time. But yeah, I haven't seen any slowdown in, in my experience. Yeah, and 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 I've noticed it with uh, some patients, but I'll tell you what it looks like just for me clinically when I when I can tell a patient starting to uh, adapt. And it's not a bad thing. It just means their results slow down, right? So they'll start saying things like, this fasting is getting really easy. And I'm like, how easy is it? You know, And I kind of have this thing where I go scale one through 10 intensity. When you first did your first 48, that was like an eight or nine or 10. You know, we that should always stay around a four to five difficulty. But if it starts getting down to a literal one to two, where you just 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 this the easiest thing ever, then you're probably adapting to it. There's some literature I'll send you. There, there's some, but um, so for you, you're saying you haven't noticed like it, it gotten extremely easy, right? No, but it's, it brings up a good point. So when I do like a longer beyond a forty eight, whether that's a three, four, five day, whatever, I kind of go off. Again, you know, I go from stuff. I go to more like the the spiritual aspect of it, where if I feel like I'm getting complacent, like it's not enough of a, a, a challenge in some ways, then those longer fasts is not necessarily something I plan out. The thought will come to me: Hey, do a seventy-two next week. You know, I'll try to shake it off. I don't have no reason to do it, right? Because then you're getting outside your comfort zone a little more. A four day, but I know once the thought to me like it's almost like an inspiration i'm gonna follow through with it because i got that message so i do feel like that kind of aligns with what you're saying but i, I can still be off my gut as far as hey you get placed with this so that that's interesting so i think i think you hit it right there so you are varying it up a little bit um and that's what i notice with my patients is the i call it flow fasting variability but Basically, I go once a month as a preventative measure. We're going to switch up your 48, even if you're doing good. Um, either a three, uh, three 24s, two 36s, two 48s. I let them choose. You know, how, how aggressive you want to be, how froggy you want to be. You know, let, let's go. But we got to switch it up once a week. Um, I, I, I even believe doing keto for 10 days or, or two weeks could be an alternative to a week's of fasting. Okay. Give you a break from fasting, really target that low carb keto, um, trigger some of those same mechanisms. Um, put your body on his toes and then go back to fasting. So it's always back to fasting. It's always back yeah. to long fasting though. And 100%. Yeah. Um, and, uh, so, you know, it's awesome. No, it's awesome that, that, that a lot of it you've been doing is really aligned. Um, I, I know I definitely look forward to, to more and more podcasts with you and just to see with what you're doing, what, where this space is going. Cause, um, you know, I deal a lot with the medications. So, so let, let, let's dive into that a little bit. When you, do you have people that are on these GLP ones already? These, uh, some of or not, not many that go to my challenge. No. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's, um, it's a fascinating drug. We talked a little bit about it yeah. before. Um, and, uh, as, as holistically rooted as I am, uh, to help people get off and prevent it, you know, when, when you're talking about a morbidly obese person or a very sick person, it, you know, that drug really does the GLP ones. They 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 cause people to to you know, reduce their appetite, right? Make them more insulin sensitive artificially, uh, and that's just a, an immediate fat loss, right? An immediate weight loss, and so so many things happen. I think the biggest thing is just the psychological yeah. boost of I can do it, right? Um, and me, you know, me and my medical practitioners, we help wean them off like that, that, that's the that's key cute. is that is huge for us is like, we don't even sign people up with in our programs when they're, I, we can tell they're just like, give us the medication. Like, like, no, like, no, like this is you, you, you join up our program when you're thinking maybe you don't believe you can do it, but at least you're like, Hey, I want to, the idea of losing my weight, I want the help of the meds, but I would love to get off your program makes sense. Let's roll. And so that's sort of our approach. And, you know, step number one is get into the fasting as quickly as yeah. possible. You know, I mean, yeah. oh my gosh. Um, it's so crucial. So crucial. Do you, do you have some of your um, clients go keto for a little bit first as a pre -wreck, or you just get I, into the fasting? I just get like right this? into it. Because like some of you had mentioned before, <clears throat> right out the gate, I'm looking at functional and sustainable stuff that they can essentially do in any setting and forever right so that's a lot of like 
the habit formation science with the brain. So I just go right into that. I, I found that uh, it hasn't really been any issues for my clients as far as hopping right in. I tell them, you got to get your, like you just said, they got to make the decision that, hey, it's time for a change. Once you make the decision and you don't leave it up to your feelings, that's where I feel, and that's the black or white of the panda, but the, the mindset, that word decision, I always go back to, like, means to sever. Cut yourself off from any other possibilities. You're either fasting or you're feasting with what I teach. Like, there's no, like, oh, let me see how I feel. Like, if you committed to doing a one meal a day, this, this today, then that's what you're doing, right? And, and it opens up a lot of energy and headspace when you don't have to say, oh, let me just have moderation today or let me rely on my willpower because the willpower is so finite and that's part of the reason the traditional North American diet does one of the many reasons but part of the reason it doesn't work is it's based on willpower a lot of times people can't wait for it to be done and that to me is a clue like okay if you're waiting for it to be done it's probably not the right approach right kid right like it's when we go back to thinking about hey lifestyle what can you form what can you add into your life that you can essentially if you want it to do forever I wanted to interrupt the show to tell you guys about the free resources that I have for you to be successful in 2024. The link in the show notes is going to provide you a way to join the free Facebook community. We do weekly live training. It's a great community. We'll answer all your questions with or without the medications. We're going to help you get there. And there's a free PDF which breaks down the steps so that you know exactly what to do, how to do it to be absolutely successful this year for your weight loss goals. Now back to the show. 100%. Yeah, mindset's huge, actually. Um, Glad you brought that up. And that could be our kind of last topic for for today's, um, you know, for me, mindset is huge. And uh, so we train on that very often because I'm training my group once a week and uh, mindset probably comes up at least once or twice a month. And uh, so for these people using these medications as a tool, the thing about the thing that's so crazy about this medication, uh, these, these semaglutide or zepatide, and we use zepatide more often, but they're so powerful at reducing appetite. And and unfortunately, you don't get to control like, okay, on a scale of one through 10, 10 being the most hungry, I would like to dial down my hunger just to a five, right? You don't get to choose that, right? Some people get their, dial, their hunger dialed down to one or non-existent, um, which actually, and I made a video about this, is problematic, right? Because we just talked about mindset and, and, and mindset, the mind itself is, is a system in the body, like the muscular system that needs to be yeah. trained in order to get stronger. Yeah. And so for these people, I believe they need the medication because the, it'd be like a person trying to bench press 350 for the first time. They just, they just can't do it. So they need the medication to lighten the weight. But if they lighten the weight too much, right, and they get really comfortable with benching, you know, you know, 40 pounds, at, you know, as a 200 pound male, like it's a problem. They, they, they literally weaken and, and no one's talking about this. No one's mentioning this. And so I find myself in this in this territory where it's just like, wow, like, how is it that I don't see people talking about that? One of the important keys, if you ever want to develop the ability to be off of the medication is just that 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 training of even just an understanding, hey, okay, I lost my weight. My hunger has been so severely artificially reduced. I need to get back to normalcy. A normal person is supposed to have hunger, right? And you don't get to choose when you're, it's 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 an operation of your hormones, but I am the thing that runs my body and I can make a decision when I'm hungry, if I'm going to eat or not. Right. And I got it. And like, like you were talking about, right. That, that, that mindset, that, that ability. Uh, And on the other flip end, the, especially if you're eating one meal a day, that ability to eat a lot because I've realized that's what I need to do, yeah. right? It is. So our an- yeah, and our ancestors, I mean, this is what they did for millions of years. I, I talk about this a lot too, just to put it in perspective for people. You know, our earliest ancestors, three million years, we have only had steady states of food for the last 10,000. So just think about that. The majority of three million years, they didn't get a choice. This is the lifestyle they had to do, right? And and everybody alive today, me, you, and and four hundred pound obese lady down the street, all evolved from from our ancestors that actually had the best systems at being able to go long periods of time. And then when they do have food, store that extra fuel, that extra calorie source as body fat, so they can tap into it in later later yeah. times. And yeah. so you know, humans have lost 
have really lost that ability. Um, even though we have the systems, we still have metabolic flexibility potential. We still have a, fa a, a powerful fat uh, mobilizing and fat storing system, but but they wonder why, you know, when I try to fast, I feel like crap for the first time. A lot of people do because like you've never used that system. Yeah. <laughs> and you're and you're wondering why you feel like crap. Yeah. Yeah. It's silly, man. It, but it's great with the genetic, you know, the, our ancestors and all that. Like you said, this is what we're designed to do. And it does come down to the active mind. And I think that hunger, like me, that makes you feel more alive the central primal thing that we're supposed to experience you know for people that don't ever want to feel hunger it's just not real life and you're missing out on something 100 percent. i i have to and i'll and i'll joke and i'll tell patients look i wanted to experience what zero hunger felt like so yeah i tried it for a couple of weeks with the terzepatite i just wanted to see and i was like oh my god this is amazing i you know i fasted for three and a half days it was such a breeze but then it's like okay after two weeks of doing that, it's like, this is not normal. This is a very disconnected art of drug induced artificial state. And you're, and you're, you know, you're fooling yourself. If you think there's going to be no cost down the road and that's not, you know, I love these medications because of how, what, what they do, but, but all medications come at a risk, all medications come at a cost and optimal health means the least amount of medications. Right. And so, um, a lot of people bring up this concept of like, well, if I started blood pressure medications to get my blood pressure down and now it's stable, you wouldn't just take me off the blood pressure medications. That's their defense. That's that, that's that defense that they try to, when they get critical of, of stuff that I talk about. Um, and it's like, no, of course not. We wouldn't just randomly remove blood pressure medications. But if we were able to implement lifestyle choices that actually handled the blood pressure after we stabilized it, why would you continue to take the medication if you didn't need it anymore? That's the flip, right? That, that, that's the back. And just nobody, again, is talking about that. And no one's preaching that. Most doctors aren't, unfortunately. Um, and it is a sad state of affairs right now that people have to, you know, navigate and, and, and make their own decisions and, and be scared when they make decisions. Stuff like what we're talking about, unfortunately, because of the way media portrays it, is scary to some people. Isn't that wild? Like the stuff that our ancestors did for millions of years is, yeah. is scary or intense yeah. or dangerous. It's like, are yeah, you kidding me? Yeah, total the programming. You know, and I, I don't think mainstream has any interest in us being supremely healthy. No, no, they don't. No, they don't. And I always <laughs> have to be, I have to tame myself on what I want to say just because I'm like, they're probably watching right now, but <laughs> <laughs> oh, brother, man, this was great. No, I'm glad we, I'm yep. glad we connected. We should definitely try to do yep. this at least, you know, once every other month or something, yeah, just to stay this. connected and, you know, see what you're yeah, seeing. And yeah, 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 absolutely. Now, our last, our last show, we had a decent amount of views, I yeah. think. Um, so we'll see how this yeah. one does. Um, and uh, yeah, man, let's. Yeah, let's bro, stay in touch. sounds good, man. I appreciate you having me on. Absolutely. Um, good having okay. you on, man. Talk soon.